Hey VC Stack community, we are kicking off a new series where we interview experts in different fields in the venture industry. This time we are starting off with Pedram from EQT Ventures. He is working as a head of data management and we had a really nice discussion about how to build a data-driven venture fund. I hope this discussion is helpful for your own fund and yeah, let's jump right in. First question that I have for you is how did you end up at EQT and what excites you the most about your current job as head of data management at EQT? Uh, very good. Both of the questions are very good, but very hard to answer. So but the, the first question is how did I end up at EQT? Uh, and I, I actually haven't been working within private equity before. So that was just a pure chance that I uh, started working with private equity. And that was due mainly to my old boss moving uh, to EQT. And he reached out and said that I'm working with a private equity company in Sweden. And by then, I didn't even know what private equity was, to be entirely honest. Um, I had no clue. But then he explained how the business works and what the, the purpose of the company was and what EQT is trying to achieve. And I felt that this was a very interesting opportunity to work for a company that nurtures um, entrepreneurs, nurtures good quality companies to grow and improve and also have a good footprint both from an environmental perspective, but also from a, just a growth perspective within the companies as well. And being a part of that growth journey was something that was very attractive. So I was very keen on getting, getting started with that. So, but what, what do I do personally at EQT? So I've been doing multiple different things. I started off with working with value creation. So I worked very closely with the deal teams and was working as an advisor for the portfolio companies mainly through a channel that we call digital business development. And what that is, is basically that we act as advisors for our deal professionals. So when they do a deal or they do a due diligence of a deal, we act as the technical specialist that helps with the technical due diligence throughout the acquisition period, but also during the time of holding, we act as an advisor, both to the deal professional, but also to the C-suite of the portfolio company. And my specialty was and is specifically within the data domain. And so I try to help out as much as I can with just advising on what technologies to invest in when it comes to data, uh, both, uh, both on the database side, on the data science side, on the dashboarding side, but also a bit more softer things such as how should you organize your data teams? Uh, what, what works, what doesn't work? And what architectural principles should you try to use? Uh, so that was the type of things that I started off doing at EQT, but that very... Uh, soon transitioned into a new role uh, that was the head of data management. And that's making sure that we have a good solid data platform for our internal operations, because as hopefully as some of your listeners know, EQT has grown a lot in the past couple of years. And now we're very close to thousand employees. And, and when you are uh, at that size, uh, it, it, it becomes very important that you have a solid functioning operations and everything is streamlined as much as possible and you have strict and clear processes on how you operate so i'm trying to make sure that we have good data platforms good data, uh, data structures to make sure that our operation functions and works as efficient and uh, as efficient as possible how does EQT in general uh, think about data and its importance for the business of a private equity fund so uh, EQT is a very data-driven company, and we have an extreme uh, ambitions regards of data, both on how we act within internal operations, but also how we do our deal, deal sourcing side and deal and value creations for our portfolio companies. So if we just if we start off with the deal sourcing side, we very early on, we doubled down on betting on machine learning for our investment strategies that was called mother brain. So what we 
are doing and did back then very early on was invest heavily in data scientists that was good with scraping data and creating connection between unstructured data that is out there on, on internet to be able to score good companies out there. And to be able to do that in a proper way, of course, you have to have very extensive data science knowledge, but you have to also have a very good data engineering knowledge. So we built up and a data, a very vast big data set. So we built up a, a really uh, state of the art data strategy in the sense that we invest in a cloud data platform that was in GCP. We heavily invested in uh, good technology for scraping the in information and data and build good pipelines. And that led us to doing a couple of really, really interesting acquisitions. And we've actually found several interesting unicorns with the help of our strategy that we have had with Motherbrain. Uh, and uh, and what we're seeing is that that's, that strategy is just improving and growing. And we're seeing more and more areas that we can apply this strategy on. So this is the deal sourcing side. How What do we do with the value creation? So there we can, of course, do a lot of different interesting stuff, such as uh, help portfolio companies with uh, market market data, such as what's the macro, macro situation in your region? Uh, what's the trends within your industry, within your company? Uh, do we have any other portfolio company within the same segment that you can interact with and share data across uh, your different companies? Of course, then the company should not be competing in any way, but very often we never invest in competing companies. So we make try to make sure that if we invest in companies in the similar segment, that they are not in the competing competing areas in the in the world at least. Uh, so, uh, and then we can help out with uh, LinkedIn data, of course, with finding good industrial advisors. We can help out with making sure that they give uh, good candidates to the company. So that's the part when it comes to value creation. And then, of how course, we... Uh, uh, yeah. How much of all of this is self-service for your portfolio companies or how... Or, or is it some something like a concierge service that you are offering? Mm. Uh, good, a good one. Uh, it's it's a little bit both. I think that we're trying to aim for creating more and more self service because then it's not going to be so dependent on individuals such as myself to actually go out there and talk with every single portfolio company. Because if we can provide a product, for example, to our portfolio companies where they can just go into a portal and get answers to, to their own questions directly, that would be a much more scalable approach. But we haven't really come that far yet because, as you probably know, every company's challenges are extremely unique and they have unique type of questions. So you as an expert trying to build a knowledge product or knowledge capital in extremely dynamic ways that can answer all of the different questions that they might have becomes a bit hard. But for some very niche segments such as ESG, where we're trying to build products ourselves, yeah. where they can just go into a portal and say, okay, how is my company performing in regards of ESG compared to the benchmarks, for example, or I'm looking for buying a tool to collect ESG data, what tools are out there that could fit my company in regards of pricing and regards of industry, for example. Yeah. Uh, so that's type of services that we provide. Did you have at any point have a, like a something like a special surprise moment since working in the venture industry? Something where you looked at a set of data or something that you took out of the data and thought, wow, this is something that is truly amazing or surprising? So the, the thing with ventures company in general, I think it's it, it's so, uh, so, so it's so varying the level of data maturity, you, you could say. Some companies, they have extremely well-structured data sets, and some companies don't have at all very good data structure, uh, like data strategies as a whole. And that's very natural because depending on your business, 
you might either invest in data or you might invest your time and, and money in other aspects of the business even more. But one thing that has always positively surprised me in a good way is ventures company, because that they don't really have a lot of legacy, they are very keen on and good with pivoting and using the latest state-of-the-art technology. So whenever there comes a new product, they very often jump and start using that very quickly compared to a company, a mid-market company that has been on the market for say 30, yeah. 40, 50 years. They have so much legacy for them to actually start adapting to a new product means that they have to refactor a, a solution that they might have been using for five, 10 years. And that's not always super easy. But for a startup, yeah. it's usually much easier because they might have just been using a product for a couple of months, six months, and convincing 10, 20 other people to using a new product is usually much simpler than convincing a company of three, 400 <laughs> people to use a new product. Yeah. Cool. Totally understood. Um, as most of our like readers and listeners are in the investment space themselves. So GPs or investment professionals or angel investors that are thinking about maybe raising a fund soon. I want to move over to a few questions in regards to that. So first of all, what do you think? Is it useful for every fund manager out there to think about data or which are the ones that should focus on something else? Because in the end, EQT has some of the biggest funds out there. But um, there are, has been a recent rise in solo GPs, micro funds, and all of that. So is it also interesting for them to look at data? Um, I think everybody needs to look at data. And I think that everybody do. But then the question comes, how so sophisticated data solution do you want to build? And how much do you want to do? proprietary, your own proprietary solutions compared to just buying off the shelf tools. Um, I would say I would not recommend a small company to try to set up their own data shop because to be able to be really successful of building a data team uh, is that you need to have at least four to five people working on something. Uh, and and that is a very big investment if you're a very small fund. Uh, you usually don't really have that room to doing that. But instead, what you can do is buy off-the-shelf tools out there. And there are so many interesting ones out there today on the market. And constantly, there are new tools popping up every day with interesting you know, ways of using them and interacting with them you probably all of you have probably seen in social media about the new chat gpt for example uh, so chat gpt has revolutionized the way that you can interact and communicate with with with, with the internet um, and i'm seeing a lot of interesting products that is leveraging chat gpt for getting more structured data sets out of internet so you can start asking ChatGPT, for example, what uh, give me structured data set about revenue about this this and that company, and it can actually give you a pretty decent answer. And then there are customized tools that are leveraging ChatGPT to give you some more, you know, some additional information. So, so I would say my recommendation would be to if you're a small company buy an off-the-shelf tool, then focus on a tool that is a bit more modern and uses AI and hopefully uses a natural language, uh, a natural language very similar to ChatGPT. If you're a bigger company and have a bigger fund, roughly in, in a size of, say, 1 billion or above, then you can actually invest in having your in-house team. Because if you do that, then you can actually have a competitive advantage compared to other people that are also using other you know, off-the-shelf tools. Because if you're using the same off-the-shelf tools as everybody else, it means that you're competing with the same companies that everybody else is doing. But if you have your own proprietary tool, maybe you will have a specific small edge compared to your competitors. And that could be a very interesting edge to have 
uh, in a very competitive market. Yeah. So recently I've seen a lot of like LP decks where new funds were raised and GPs were writing something in their decks of the like uh, of, okay, we are using cutting edge technology to source our data, evaluate, uh, source our deals, evaluate our deals and help our portfolio companies. And I assume for some of them, it's just a bullshit bingo, as I would call it. So from the LP perspective, what kind of due diligence can I do to really check if the stuff that the GP is telling me is true or is there any way to do it? Um, so, of course, you can cut through some of the BS if you are, are well-versed within the domain, but sometimes you're not. So you're not maybe a you uh, have a background within technology and don't know all of the lingo. So it becomes very hard to understanding, do they really have the technologies that they're talking about? But uh, yeah, it's it, I don't really have a straight answer. I would say that the best way is to having an expert that can actually cut through because usually if I personally, if I ask a couple of follow-up questions, very often I can detect if somebody yeah. knows what they're talking about or not. But if I'm a novice, then they can always use a couple of words that sounds very trendy and my, maybe I will be fooled. And another very important aspect is that this is something that some people don't really understand fully is that front end can look extremely nice, but has nothing to do with how competent a product and tool might be. So if you might have a very good front-end designer building your application, it might look like the most beautiful platform in the world. But if in the back end it doesn't work and you can be fooled by the front-end, then you might you know, buy the wrong platform and the wrong tools. And I've seen this happening so many times uh, that people, the business people go out and buy very uh, expensive software uh, that doesn't really function properly. But here's the thing. Here would be my recommendation. I would say, uh, uh, apologies if this is a very long, long explanation, but uh, historically, when you wanted to try out a tool, you had to have a very long RFP process. You had to install a server. You had to install and buy a license for a full year. You had to have specialists to install the, the software on your machine. But nowadays, you very often can try out the tool by a trial period. So what I would say, if you want to cut through BS, the best way is trying out tools. Use trials and spend proper time on really trying the tool out. And then when you're negotiating with the vendor, make sure that you get a free trial or at least a trial that is so cheap so you can very easily opt out if you're not yeah. satisfied with the tool and the services. Yeah. And, and this is something that is definitely possible today with the new cloud, cloud era. It was not possible 10 years ago because everything needs to be installed on your on-prem service. Cool. So that would be my recommendation. Nice, got it. So I have two more questions for you. So first one would be, um, so if I have a bigger fund, uh, if I'm a GP and now I want to ramp up my data team, so what are your top recommendation tips, experiences on hiring the right people for your data team? Where do I find them and what is the profile of the people? It's not a super simple answer to be entirely honest, because the thing is that this is evolving day by day by day to be entirely honest. So I, I have to give you context to, uh, to so you understand what I mean. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, we had a technology that was very extensively used and probably still used by some. And that was uh, writing access databases and VBA code, basically. And, and that was, you know, cutting edge by its time. And then later on, SQL came into the picture people started connecting their access databases to SQL. 
And then all of a sudden, SQL became very important. Then all of a sudden, other technologies came in, and that was OLAP cubes and MDX. And then all of a sudden, everybody wants to jump on that. And then after that, we got to the big data sets and Hadoop and data clusters. So the thing is that the technologies is growing and evolving all the time. So the roles that you need to hire for are also changing over time, unfortunately. Hence, it makes it very hard. So if I tell you data engineer, you need to hire data engineers. It's extremely different what a data engineer does at Spotify or at Amazon compared to a data engineer at EQT because they are, have entirely different roles. So, so what do you need to hire for? I would say a data engineer, but the data engineer doesn't need to know how to build very customized code. They just need to understand business very well so they can write SQL code in a simple, in a simple way and then transfer that into uh, data that a business person can understand and decipher. So I usually, instead of calling them data engineer, uh, data analyst, you can sometimes call them, but you need to have some SQL competency. Then I would say that some other of the roles, such as data scientist, is that relevant or not? Yes, that could be very relevant if you have good, solid, qualitative data sets for the data scientists to work with. So don't start off by hiring a data scientist before you have a very, very solid data set for the data scientists to work with. So that's very important. Then you have other roles that I think is pretty important to have is the analyst, the pure analyst that just can understand the data, make sense out of the data, and and expose the data to the broader audience in the business. Usually they don't need to be engineers in the background whatsoever. It could be people, associates working with the funds. It could be people within the, already in the organization. Just reuse the Excel savvy people that you already have. So, but be very cautious. Don't be fooled by just going with the name of the roles. You really need to understand what this person needs to do before you just uh, just go out and say, I want to have a data engineer and then just hire a random data engineer because it's uh, so different depending on where they come from and what technologies they're used to. Cool. Thank you so much for these like valuable insights. I want to finish off this with one question and this is how do you personally envision the future of investing? Hmm. Uh, that, that's uh, interesting as well. I, I, I'm seeing, of course, that data is becoming more and more, more important in investing, especially, especially for us. I think with the help of data sets and specifically for ventures companies, we're going to be able to find companies much early in much earlier stages and, and invest in more deals than we do today. Because the reason why we don't invest in, say, more, more than the, the ones that we do today is because we don't really have the capacity of going out to more companies. But you, if you have computers and machines that can actually do all of the legwork for you, so the only thing that you have to do is, as a deal professional saying, just do sanity checks and then go out there and do just the signing the papers, then all of a sudden you can do enormous amount of deals with a very low efforts. And then all of a sudden you can diversify the funds a bit more even. So I'm definitely seeing a higher rate of transactions in the future based on, uh, based on the help of computers. I'm seeing investment in earlier stages uh, with the help of computers as well. Um, uh, but I'm also seeing uh, a bit more, and in general, I'm seeing a bit more niched products out there in the market as well. So previously, where you had had products that aim to do a lot of different things, I think the companies today, they they try to be a bit more niche. Uh, and, and I think that that's uh, going to continue happening as well in the future. 
Uh, I'm not sure exactly when we're going to see some consolidation uh, of, you know, softwares and things like that. But uh, in the foreseeable time, I think that that's uh, that's what I'm seeing still going to happen in the near future. Nice. Thank you so much. This was a great finish to our talk. Uh, Pedram, thank you so much for spending half an hour with us. And uh, yeah, thanks. It's my honor and pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me.